Welcome to the final event of this year's Bannon Institute Big Protect from the Public Sphere. My name is Deborah Whiteman. I'm head of the Archives and Special Collections here at Santa Clara. Um, the work of these nations Center is to advance the distinctly Je Jesuit and Catholic tradition of education here at Santa Clara by promoting the integration of faith, justice, and the intellectual life on campus and in a larger community. One of the ways the center seeks to do this is through the year-long Bannon Institute. Today's event, the final event of this Bannon Institute year, is comprised of a panel of artists whose work is exhibited in our adjoining gallery as part of the Dialoguing with Sacred Text exhibit. <coughs> Sponsored by our Archives and Special Collections Department along with the Jesuit Center for Education. And just let me say it's been such a delight to partner with the Ignatian Center on this project. Um, it's just brought so many people to Santa Clara University, to our campus, from our local and um, campus communities. So many people from outside and to see this building, the Learning Commons, the exhibit, and it's just been great. Um, this exhibit brings together contemporary artists working in a variety of media to engage the unfolding of dynamic, the unfolding dynamic of sacred texts. Uh, ancient and contemporary sacred books and objects with our diverse tra traditions and contexts are also featured. <clears throat> I hope that you will take some time following our panel to take in the exhibit, which continues on until June 30th. We've been so privileged to collaborate in the creation of this exhibit with Michelle Townsend, who, worked, who served as curator for the Dialoguing with Sacred Texts exhibit, and uh, the full title of that, Dialoguing with Sacred Texts, an exhibit of sacred texts, past, present, and future. Michelle herself will introduce the three artists of our panel today, Lisa Koken, Renee Billingsley, and Mel Day. Uh, then the artists will reflect, re reflect briefly on their work and engage in a dialogue with one another and all of us around the topic of today's panel, making meaning through mystery and community, text and context. However, first let me introduce you to our curator and facilitator of today's panel, and I'd just like to say a word about her, Michelle Townsend. Michelle, has, Michelle Townsend has worked in the Bay Area Arts community since 1998 as a gallery director, artist coach, and project manager. She has considerable experience in, with nonprofit organizations, having been an employee, volunteer, teacher, and board member. She is most recently president of the board of directors at Root Division and director of art operations for the missing piece, artists consider the Dalai Lama. The missing piece, an, exhi an exhibition that featured 88 internationally acclaimed artists, was shown in 10 venues, both in the US and overseas, and Santa Clara University was one of those. You may remember it was here, in, uh, a portion of it was here in 2010, and Michelle was a big part of that, um, that exhibition. Um, so uh, let's see, it also, I guess we're talking about the missing piece here, I was also at the UCLA Fowler Museum, yes, <laughs> the, um, okay, the Rubin Museum, and the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, as well as museums in Tokyo, Madrid, Romania, and Stockholm, so in good company. Her independent count, uh, curatorial projects include family, family pictures from Root Division to July 2009 and Dialoguing with Sacred Text which will next be shown at the Man Risa Gallery at the University of San Francisco. So isn't that great? It's traveling on to San Francisco, yay! <laughs> um, she has a BA from Hamilton College and an MA from San Stanford University. Please join me in welcoming Michelle Townsend. starting things or getting ready to bid farewell to friends, but um, thanks for making the time to be 
part of this conversation this afternoon. Joining me today, Renee Billingsley, who may be known to some of you, um, is on the faculty here at Santa Clara in the Department of Art and Art History. Lisa Koken, who makes her home in Berkeley and is a well-renowned well Bay Area artist. And to my left is Mel Bay, um, an equally well-renowned Bay Area artist. So <laughs> I'm not gonna go too, into too much detail about their biographies because I want uh, for us to focus a little bit on the artwork this afternoon. So the way the, the, way the discussion is gonna work is that um, I'm gonna talk first a little bit about the curatorial process and I'm gonna ask each artist to talk a little bit about her work. And I'll, the three of us, or the four of us, are going to speak to some questions that I've prepared in a little bit of a conversational format, and then after that we'll open it up for Q&A from the audience. But one of the things I'm so pleased about is that we're in this lovely, intimate space, and I am much happier when things proceed like a dialogue. So even though we've got a table and microphones and so forth, um, I'd like for this to be sort of an open and organic discussion, and if, as the artist is talking about their work, there's a question that you want to have, I hope that you'll raise your hand and have it addressed. Um, the other thing that I'm hoping will happen, and that I've seen happen time and again on artist panels, is that when you get a group of artists together to talk about their work, there's this kind of organic magic that happens where they feed off each other and they discover things that they want to share. So as I said, I'm hoping very much that this will become a conversation. So, hear from the artists, questions from me, and then questions from all of you, I hope. So the first thing I want to talk about a little bit is how we got here this afternoon. Um, I have been so fortunate to be a part of bringing this exhibition together, and so I want to tell you a little bit of a story about my process as a curator, and let you know sort of where this exhibition comes from. I think it was 2007, might have been, it might have been, it might have been farther back than that. I went to the Headland Center for the Arts um, and I met with Mel Bay, who was at the time an artist in residence up there. And <coughs> Mel's work spoke to me and surprised me in a number of ways. She was working with videos, which you'll see in just a second, to engage essentially contemporary tools to ask age-old spiritual questions. And I had been working in the galleries here in San Francisco for a long time and studied art history and you know sort of read the books and got the magazines and so much of the work that I saw had a very distant relationship to spirituality, a very sort of hands-off, ironic preference for things that were um, sort of what I, what I would consider aggressively secular. And what really kind of knocked me out about Mel's work was the fact that she was asking these complicated questions using contemporary tools in a way that was both reverent and relevant. And I think that's a, and it struck me that she was walking a very, finding a very specific kind of balance that I hadn't come across yet. This is the part where I embarrass you a little bit. <laughs> um, I felt that she was meaning, meaningfully bridging worlds of both art and spirituality in a contemporary context, which is a very difficult thing to do. And so I kind of put in the back of my mind the idea of wanting to do a show about spirituality or you know, possibly even a show about God. But what struck me, though, is that it had taken me such a long time to find Mel's work, and I didn't want to do the exhibition until I found other work that I thought would really, would, would really go together. And so fast forward a couple of years when I'm working on the Dalai Lama project, and I have the chance to come to Santa Clara and get to know Deborah Whiteman and the other folks here, and to have the, ch the chance to work in this beautiful exhibition space, and more precisely in the context of a Jesuit institution with its focus on spiritual investigation and and the idea of bringing that exhibition, which was about, which was largely about a uh, living peacemaker and a Buddhist icon, to this kind of a community, really got me thinking about the possibility of trying to do this exhibition again, and then enter the Ignatian Center with its Bannon Institute's focus this year on sacred texts in the public sphere, and all of a sudden we have a Jesuit institution that's focused on spirituality and learning. We have this beautiful archive and special collections gallery with all these spectacular books. And then the possibility of doing an exhibition, an exhibition that brings that brings contemporary artists into the dialogue about sacred texts in the public sphere, and all of a sudden the chance to use artwork to examine questions of spirituality and the public context. And so I thought, wow, here we are, the chance to finally pull all this together. So it's been a terrific opportunity because, from a curatorial perspective, exhibitions don't work 
work unless you have the right artist and unless you have the right context. And that context here involves not just the physical space, but the community as well. And so bringing those three impulses, bringing those three forces together for this exhibition was incredibly exciting. The other piece of all of that, of course, is the artist. As I said a moment ago, I didn't want to do this exhibition until I was sure I could find the right artist. And one of the things that has been such a thrill is to reach out to the three who are on the panel here, to Meg Hitchcock, whose work that you'll see in the other room, Thomas St. Meyer, Sarah Philly, whose prayer rope is hanging on the second floor, Terry Garland, whose photographs are on the second floor, Donald and Eric Farnsworth, Faye Alavi, some really wonderful artists who are asking questions that derive from, who are they're employing text, they're asking questions that derive from text, they're examining um, a set of really complicated things in a language that is visual and as a consequence somewhat inequitable. And one of the things that I love so much about it is the fact that once you, it's one thing to, to think sort of theoretically and say, oh, I like that piece, and oh, I like that piece, I think I'll, I'll think I'll put those together. And then all of a sudden to hang the exhibition and to see the work installed, there's this other whole dimension of dialogue and conversation that starts to happen when the artworks themselves begin to talk to each other. So seeing that, again, in the context of this institution and this beautiful library and this beautiful gallery next door can be super exciting. So that's my bit. Um, and now, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to add to that. Oh, so one of the other things that were important to me in the selection of the artists, we talked about wanting to include work from different space positions. It was really important to me that even though we were in the context of um, a cast exhibition that we were examining a variety of different, um, a variety of different spiritual approaches. And so there's work that's grounded in Buddhist texts, work that from, comes from the Quran. We have um, some really, uh, we have a beautiful Torah scroll that we borrowed from a bookseller in, uh, from a bookseller in Los Angeles, as well as some other, um, some other traditions. Okay, I think that's all I'm gonna say. Um, so to wrap that up, I think, think about art as a lens Think about art as a way of seeing and processing the world. Think about it to the same extent that it's important for an academic to pursue his or her work through writing or research or for a scientist to approach things through the scientific method. From my perspective, artwork engages the same kinds of research and trial and error and thinking and adds another, it's like another whole tool for talking about some of the things that the lecture series has focused on throughout the year. So again, my gratitude Okay, so I'm gonna stop talking now. Um, next up is Mel Bay. And as I said, what I've asked the artists to do is to go to talk a little bit about their body of work and specifically about some of the things that they chose for this show. And if you have questions that you're thinking about for them, feel free to raise your hand. I'll probably be scribbling away and you can ask some of them afterwards as well. So, Matt? Thank you. My work grapples with what is often referred to as spiritual inquiry, but I find it best to describe, at least in my case, as a preoccupation with uncertainty, ambivalence, um, a search for meaning, uh, ambiguity, uh, like, and uh, mystery. Uh, these, are, these are words I think we'll discuss more that follow, but this is something that I've been preoccupied for some time now. So I'll get to the work in the show in a few minutes, but let me start somewhere, let me start with a piece right away that will help to give context to some of these things I just discussed. And I'd like to um, invite you to be a one minute Thank you. 
you might recognize that tune. It's uh, the doxology. And I asked members of my immediate family to hum this ecclesiastical hymn by themselves without any other direction other than what they, how they would normally sing it. But also, you might tell it's hard to, to recognize when one person starts singing and another begins. It was very much interest to me. Also, that the sounds were both harmonious and dissonant at the same time uh, came across as that I was looking for, and also the hum seemed to embody a kind of ambivalence in itself, because it's somewhere like it's like the half language, somewhere between knowing and not knowing, or singing and not singing, speaking and not speaking. And at the end of the day, it was a surprise to me how sad this piece was. I certainly didn't expect it to be that way, <laughs> but it definitely came across, not to my family, they thought it was hilarious. <laughs> Story altogether. So I created this work out of my own deepening questioning, but also out of a sense of growing frustration with how the language of faith seems to become increasingly co-opted by various interest groups. And I was, fast, I was trying to find a way to speak to that, think about it for myself, and also open it up to other people in different ways so we could get past that, those stumbling blocks, if you like. And this became a pivotal work. What was the first video piece I ever made, actually, and it became a pivotal um, uh, moment for me to inquire about this and other works to follow. So that's why I really wanted to see this first. So following that, I created another video and sound piece that shows my husband and I treading water with our hands in the air while singing How Great Thou Art. Um, and after a few minutes, we can't do it any longer. And I won't show it to you because we don't have time, but we eventually submerge exhausted. <laughs> and. Uh, the day we filmed it, it happened to be raining, and it's also warm, and the water was steaming. So there was this, there was kind of a, a even though it was a difficult thing to negotiate when we were filming, it turned out to be a beautiful environment and added to the piece. It's unclear in the end if we're drowning or being baptized, holding our hands up for help or in supplication. And that was interesting to me, once again, that ambivalence. Because what I found was that it was really opening it up to the viewer's own experience of faith and making meaning of the work. And that seemed to be critical. For example, when my mother saw the piece, who, she's a Christian, she explained, you're being baptized. And so it's like, <laughs> you know, drowned or went underwater. And my atheist friend, Andrew, was immediately concerned and called me and thought I was going through some kind of crisis of faith of some kind. So I, I like that people have very different interpretations and I, and I like to keep that open-endedness. So I created, um, this piece a number of years ago while a fellow at the Headland Center for the Arts. And I'll just play another short clip of this. Very uh, 
um, fascinating and they're highly reverberant spaces as it turns out. And I found that a Buddhist monk actually chants back and forth in these spaces. And there was a kind of call and response back then. This really intrigued me. So a few years later, I decided to create a piece that invited two Episcopalian priests, two scientists, and one rose gospel singer to meet me in one of these abandoned tunnels early one morning. Um, as you can see there, that's what it looked like. Um, as, uh, I asked them to chant two very different texts back and forth to each other. They were two different stories about believing and not believing. One was taken from Richard Dawkins' God Delusion, and one was taken from Anne Lamott's Traveling Mercies, so more, a more theistic Christian writer. The result was this almost physical collision of reverberant and resonant overlapping sounds. The chanters were interacting with each other, but also modifying their chanting to um, accommodate for the resonant environment. And the, their the voices were overlapping, and, it, and the sound became unintelligible in a way, but also that became interesting as part of the piece. So that, I felt, was a good lead-in to the work that I had in the show. And this is uh, the larger piece I have, which is the first volume from a three-volume series called The Study Guide for Experimental Contemplatives. And this is the volume of, called Performative Exchange. These works were researched and designed during a visiting artist residency at the Stanford Experiment Experimental Media Arts Lab. So my goal for these series was that they would continue to provoke and focus some of the issues that I've been thinking about in the work that I just showed you. And I really wanted to focus especially around having this really genuine, mutually receptive dialogue around these issues that, that I've been discussing. A place where we could bypass the problems of language in some way and deepen our own questioning and, and kind of get to a more um, meaningful, genuine space in some way. And I wondered what would that look like to have a book where people of all faiths and no faith could get to feel engaged and open to genuine dialogue. Because I know that many of the study guides that I've been a part of, and I'm sure it's not always the case, sometimes seem to have leading questioning, there's very certain answers, and I was interested in something highly experimental. And I wasn't talking about as much land or neutral, recepti uh, neutral uh, recepti re receptivity, but a critical engagement of our own assumptions and a questioning of our own um, positions and an openness to others. So this work asked the viewer to imagine the possibilities of such a book. And this is the uh, cover photo. Here I am balancing between the church shoes and my fluorescent yellow coat, which gives me permission to do such things. And um, some of you may recognize that this is Stanford Memorial Church. I had the privilege of doing another piece there at the time, from sunrise to sunset, so I had a lot of time to play around. <laughs> and it turns out my body just barely fits between the church shoes. It's the most extreme Pilates move. It took many repeated attempts and falling flat on my face. but. I eventually got it, and I was interested in, once again, this idea that my body was translating this ambivalent space of both floating and straining and bridging the two. So the next volume, which isn't in the show, but I printed the same size, they're both fairly large, um, explores absorption practices. And this cover photo uh, shows me sitting on top of a shower in our community pool area. And I have a Magritte-like fusion with the shower stall that was a complete accident, happy accident. I was just crossing my legs in front of me and the shower, if you see the, picture, uh, the image larger, you'll see that the rain, it's like raining down beneath me with the shower. And um, this, in, this photograph was specifically influenced by the Skylight Saints, um, otherwise known as the Pillar Saints, who are extreme Christian ascetics who would sit literally for all their life on top of pillars, burning incense and fasting and praying and preaching. And the burning of the incense was interesting to me, so I, I uh, tried to do that as well on top of the shower stall. Mm -hmm. This volume is, explores uh, med meditation practices and the olfactory imagination, which is just a fancy way of saying incense and, and, and scent and so forth, as a form of experimental contemplation. The third volume is called The Possibility of Sound, and in this piece I'm sitting on top of a pruned bush um, that appears to be hooked up electronically, magnifying my voice to the heavens above. And this volume explores the possibility of song and the oral imagination in keeping our contemplative practice. And finally, just the last couple of pieces um, from the show are some smaller works that are the um, that show spreads based on the scans of old books with my own drawn notations and painted bookmarks. 
this particular one just shows an icon glimpsing out the top, but there's a few other ones that you can check out. I worked on the large format scanners and printers that were available at, at Stanford's EMA lab, and it was fantastic because the way that the scanners work, it creates a very different light than a, the aperture does from a camera. So I wanted to play with that a little bit more. So while I was in a residency at Germany, in Germany this fall, I began to develop this series into light box drawings, scratching away the printed surface of the uh, printed backlit paper, which is a special kind of paper that you can use in a light box, and revealing the light behind. And so that's currently a series that I'm also working on now that's related to this work. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you. Me to be in this wonderful show. Um, the work that I have in the show is part of a larger body of work <coughs> that I did immediately after my mother's death. Um, it relates to other work that I've done. I work in artist books, mixed media installation. Um, always with recycled materials, except that the thread that I use in this work is not recycled. Um, my work often deals with history, memory, social commentary. Um, and my mom, who was almost 100 years old when she died a year ago, December, um, was a big influence on me and always supported my work. And in the last year, she had dementia. We still communicated, but um, it was a different kind of communication. Uh, so at the time that she died, I was working with thread and um, doing some work with Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, using that, um, making horticultural kinds of imagery and um, incorporating parts of the book. I often tear up books, um, which is ironic because I grew up in a house where books were reverential objects. Um, I grew up in a secular Jewish household and books were, we never did anything to <coughs> them, but I tend to tear them up now. So anyway, I was working um, with that text, and then my mom passed away, not unexpectedly, at such an advanced age, and I immediately switched over to making work about her, about her death, actually, about the last hours and days of her life. And I realized that it was, that I had been thinking about you know, when somebody is that old, you know that eventually they're, they're not going to be around much longer. Um, but when she died, I, I immediately hit the studio. And basically, um, for the next nine months, pretty much just worked on this, um, this series of work, which culminated in a show in a gallery in Mill Valley, Seeger Gray Gallery. The show is called Raveling. And raveling is a word that um, refers to a textile. When a textile starts to unravel, part that unravels is called The Raveling. So that was the title that I chose for my show. The first slide, first several slides are based on um, a journal, an empty journal that I gave to my mom when she was in her mid-90s. And I just you know, gave her some pens and I said, write down whatever you want to write down. And after she died, I discovered that she had written in about 10 of the pages, sometimes upside down, sometimes you know, unintelligibly because <coughs> Aside from the dementia, her eyesight was really going. So, but I found it really beautiful, the scrawls, you know, kind of her last words and her last words to me and, you know, for posterity. So I enlarged them and I made them in thread. Um, should I put them next to you? Okay. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Um, whoops. <laughs> it's helpful if I knew my right now. Um, so this. This page uh, is the very beginning, and it says, where do, I, where do I begin? And it basically is um, bits and pieces from her personal history, her childhood in Brooklyn, and her philosophy about life. 
Um, I wish that I had been able to really, you know, understand all of it, but you know, a lot of it is understandable and a lot of it not. But I love the way the texts look, and I love the fact that she, despite physical and mental obstacles, you know, wanted to commit these thoughts to paper. Um, I tried to limit the color palette, and I actually tried to duplicate that um, there are stains, you know, oil stains and food stains, and um, the lower right-hand corner represents a food stain, and she had taken an orange crayon and just sort of scrawled through the top line. I love the word and in this one. So this, um, this, these pieces are made all of thread. I use, um, they're made only with thread. I use a stabilizer and I sew these web-like um, images connecting all of the words together um, and to make sort of an ephemeral kind of a piece. And um, all of the work in the show had that quality because she was in this kind of um, space between life and death, which was a very fragile and ephemeral space. And I felt that this medium was a good way to um, represent that. So the details seem to have gone before the overall, so I'll just go backwards and forwards. Um, <laughs> so my mom lived in a nursing home for the last seven and a half years of her life um, in Oakland, and I visited her quite regularly. Um, when it became you know, obvious that if the end was near, I was there one day and she just started yelling, take me home now. And my mom was not, how can I describe my mother? She was, she did not mince her words. So when she was ready, she was ready. And um, the hospice nurse was quite, um, I, I felt like she must have seen everything, but she, I could see that she was quite surprised by the uh, kind of uh, vehemence with which my mother was making her desire known. So she just kept saying that over and over again, take me home now. And those words just echoed in my head when I came home. And it was just, it was such a powerful experience to witness that readiness to exit that um, that was kind of where I started. I started with the take me home now series. It became almost like a mantra. It was repeating inside of my head so much that I just started writing it without really planning what I was going to do. So this piece that looks kind of abstract, when you look at the detail, you can see the word now, which I went over a number of times because I tried to visually um, reproduce uh, the way she was saying it. She was saying it just with such you know, um, ferocity almost that I wanted that to be bold. The now was like, I mean now, I don't mean in a few minutes, I mean now, and you know, I. I was just kind of saying, okay, you know, I was just trying to be with her and, you know, validate her experience, but obviously there was nothing I could do to hasten the process. I was just trying to sort of be present with what she was experiencing. Um, I, I made a number of round pieces that people have referred to as kind of mandala-like, although that wasn't what I had thought of. But um, they're all composed of the Take Me Home Now repetitive phrase. So this one is called Take Me Home Now Arboreal because it represents, well, it, it sort of evokes the, the rains of a tree. And again, I just never really planned out how they were going to look or anything. I was just in this kind of zone of, I've got to get this down. And I've got to almost, it was almost this sort of ritualistic um, urge to get it all down and sort of work through it. Um, and I don't consider myself to be a religious person. I'm quite secular, but there was, you know, when you witness a close person to you, you know, your mother or a person who you're very close to their death, it's, you know, it's a highly um, powerful experience. So this was kind of my ritual for nine months. When I realized it was nine months, I thought that was very interesting, this gestation period, you know, the way it all worked out. Um, this is another of the Take Me Home Now series in which um, the words are kind of much more lace-like and there's a lot of negative space. And I just, this is how it ended up and this is how I, I didn't overwork it, I just kind of left it that way. So the, the words are sort of hanging, oh, very loosely connected. Very, there are very fragile connections in this piece. And then this is um, Transcript Kaddish, which is in the show. Um, 
as I mentioned, although I don't consider myself to be a religious person, somehow I felt the need to transcribe um, in Hebrew the Jewish prayer for the dead. I didn't recite it after my mom died, but I, I wrote it, I sewed it. Um, and I think she would have appreciated that because she spends her working life in front of a sewing machine along with my father. They were upholsterers. So I, this is kind of how I did it. I did it my own way. Um, so underneath, there are two texts here. In blue, there, um, there's the text of the Kaddish, and then in um, different colors is the transcript of my last conversation with my mother, which was an amazingly metaphorical conversation in which she um, talked about going on a flight. Which flight are you on? She asked me, am I on the same flight as you? And I said to her, we're on the same flight, but mind me for a little later. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was, it was a totally incredible experience. Um, and I have since read that dying people do talk in metaphors like that, and that um, evidently I did the right thing by kind of talking to her and not saying, we're not on any flights. I just kind of went along with it. Um, because she was really communicating to me that she was ready to take off. And I recognized for what it was, and somehow I had the presence of mind to write it all down. Because ever the artist, I'm always kind of looking for material. And so I had my notebook and I wrote it down because I somehow knew this was going to be our last conversation. And this is uh, one of the other pieces in the show, which is the same two texts, only um, shown in a different way. The blue is the conversation and the white which is barely visible is the Kaddish and um, I like to relate the story that um, my mom was always somebody who wanted to be prepared in life and I always had an emergency dime this was before cell phones I never left the house with an emergency dime and her last words to me were get a bottle of milk and maybe a box of crackers and you'll go so um, that's, that appears in this work too and then um, the last piece in this little presentation um, is called 9090. And right after my mom passed, uh, my partner and a couple of friends went on a walk around the, the nursing home. It was a very blustery December day. And we ga I gathered some leaves. And um, I didn't count them, but I knew that I was going to make a, a, a piece with 99 leaves, representing one leaf for each year of her life. Um, and so I did, I used the leaves that I gathered, um, whoops, sorry, um, to symbolize um, each year of her life. And then I had had a very distressed, I had collected a very distressed Hebrew prayer book years ago that I found in a state of complete disrepair. And that's how I rationalized um, to myself that I could hasten that disrepair and further distress it. So I tore it up and I put it in between the, um, the threads of these leaves. So um, this is kind of the last slide of the, this body of work about my mom. And um, in thinking about you know whether I'm a spiritual person, we can talk about all that stuff later. Um, <laughs> I feel like the experience that I had, you know, with my mom being there um, with her shortly before she died, probably was the most intensely spiritual experience that I've had, and maybe ever will have. So.
talk today, I was actually thinking about the text in my work and was surprised actually to find how much text I actually use in my work and kind of what that means. Um, so I'm going to show you some pieces that actually have, I chose pieces that have text and then show you today. But to give you a little bit of um, my background, so my first love is photography and I teach photography here at Santa Clara University. And, um, but I also, um, in grad school, discovered mixed media and how I could sort of combine my photography with my mixed media. And so um, I kind of work in, in both areas depending on what um, I need to say and what materials I need use to use to say it. So, um, so I thought I would start um, by talking a little bit about like, what I've been doing recently with my work. And that is I've been um, exploring this idea of um, deconstruction and reconstruction. And also um, just being open to materials finding their way to me and I'm never quite sure how that's going to happen. And just being able to see the materials and know that they're materials that I need to be working with. So, um, so my husband Aldo has an had an uncle that lived in San Francisco, and his name was Harry Carpenter. And he was a substitute teacher in San Francisco right up until he was 97 years old. And actually, no one at the funeral knew how old he, no one knew how old he was until his funeral. And we um, had the great honor of, of getting to spend time with him in the last few years of his life. And also, um, we took care of his belongings And um, it was a really special relationship that I had with him, getting to know him as an older African-American man who had left the South to migrate to the West to kind of um, experience a different life. And I learned a lot about him and not about myself by spending time with him. And so when he um, passed away and he went to go clear his apartment, I began to look around and realize that his belongings were my materials and the materials to be using for my art. So um, I, nothing was thrown away. I packed up all of his clothing, his shoes, his papers, and all of that. And I had them. I pulled them out as I need them. And so I, I began to think about the materials and about him as an individual and the things that I wanted to, to you know, to share about his life. And so this is the first piece that I made using his belongings. So I call these dictionary, and they're a set of, um, of two volume dictionaries, which I um, deconstructed, and then they're a pair of his shoes that I put, put them together to reconstruct them to make the shoes. So, um, so what I really like about this piece is that um, you can actually see like the, in the crevice of the shoe like where the sunion was and his in the shoe mark is still there. Like he, his imprint is still there. You can see that and um, I feel like you can learn a lot about um, him from just looking at the shoes. So um, the other piece that I made recently made um, from uh, his shirts are uh, Sunday school shirts. So um, Uncle Harry was um, very much a Christian and he never missed uh, church and he never missed Sunday school every Sunday. And um, he was the type of man that when he left his house, he would wear a, a button down shirt, a tie and a fleecy suit and a hat. And he would never leave his house without that. And so um, I took apart all of his white shirts and then reconstructed them to make, you know, what I call sort of a, sun, a Sunday school, well, it's, I call it a Sunday school shirt, it's kind of a, becomes a, a prayer shawl in a way. So, um, and then I took um, some different psalms from, uh, you know, pieces from the Bible that I thought represented him and that would be important um, scriptures for him, and I stitched them into the little seams of the, the shirts. So, 
the work that I make, I have an installation called um, The Fabric of Race, Racial Violence and Lynching in America. And it talks about the different aspects of um, lynching and also sort of the injustice that came to African American people in our history and the parts of history that American history that people don't like normally talk about. And um, and so this is all I, I feel as if these shoes are sort of a continuation of that as well. Um, and also representing Uncle Herod as an African American man um, in our society. So these are a pair of his more formal shoes. Um, and um, over the summer, I read um, a book called uh, Slave in the White House about Thomas um, uh, Jefferson's slaves and also um, Madison's main slave and his life. And I was highly influenced by this book while I was reading it and um, really felt inclined to do a piece um, about the American Constitution. And so I just uh, felt like I wanted, instead of putting all the Constitution, just to put we the people as being more um, inclusive in that. So if the, the, when you look at the shoe down in the library, you'll also see that there's there's text as well, and they're kind of um, they're in a circle, and it kind of looks like you know represents the con Constitution as if it was landing in there as well. There's the detail. Um, also. Uh, um, in my research, I came across a piece of information that just kept rumbling around in my head, um, uh, talking about um, during a, a truth about during the Jim Crow era when um, there was um, a swearing in in the courtroom that if a white person was to be sworn in, they had a separate Bible that they would use versus if an African American person was to be sworn in, they had a separate Bible that they would use, which to me seems ironic because it's the same content in both. And so I decided to actually um, deconstruct four Bibles, which <coughs> kind of I sort of um, went back and forth with in my head, um, which we can talk more about when we have the <laughs> background a little bit. Yeah, so. Um, and uh, so, but I, I really felt like it was, it was a necessary piece to make. I was very, I was called to make this piece and had the idea in my head actually before I was invited to be in the show and decided to follow through with that. Um, so, so although in the courtroom they would have most likely been two black Bibles, I used a set of white Bibles and a set of black Bibles to sort of make that point of, of this, um, this happening during the Jim, Jim Crow era. So, and those are our actual um, Bible pages underneath the shoes. And um, so kind of getting back to talk, this idea of text in my work and how the importance of it to me. And um, so this is a, a so this is a piece from this in, um, installation that I created, Fabric of Race, where each shirt um, represents a victim that was lynched. And um, on the tag includes um, the person's name and a small bit of information about that person. And I put up Emmett Till because um, I think most everyone knows the story of Emmett Till although there were like 4,600 documented names of um, primarily African-American men, but also women and children and abolitionists who were also um, lynched during the American lynching period. So each of these, um, what I call sort of identity tags are hand stitched and hang from uh, this series of shirts. And um, they're intended for 
for the viewer to actually walk up to the shirt and to touch the tag and sort of um, connect with the part of American history as well. And I also have from this installation um, hats that I've made that were inspired by a photograph of the lynching of Jesse Washington in Waco, Texas in um, 1913 was more a horrific story. And in the uh, lynching card of the photograph that you see, you see his body in the center, and then you just see this entire sea of hats of men that are surrounding his body. And so I decided to um, construct hats and then place text over each hat, talking about sort of what either a viewer of a lynching would hear, um, maybe smell or experience, and also uh, what the perpetrators, how they were involved in the, the lynching themselves. So um, I was pleasantly surprised to find how important text is to my work and um, continue to, to work with it um, in more projects. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you all. I, one of the things that um, fascinates me in this context is, I don't know how you're all feeling right now, but I'm, I'm a, I feel like I need to take a big breath. <laughs> because we've gone from um, engaging Mel's family in the creation of, a, of an ecclesiastical hymn to passing of Lisa's mother to race in the American South. And so, and, mm -hmm. and in contemporary context. And so there's some heavy stuff, not only here in the room right now, but um, in the artwork that's in the exhibition as well. And again, one of the things that I think that I love about this work, um, about the work of being a curator, is that there's this magical thing that happens when you get to hear people talk about what it is they do. So I want to touch on one of the one of the questions that um, has come to mind as the three of you were talking is, we talked a little bit about material. And one of the things that amazed me about this show and was a particularly sensitive topic as I was choosing work for the exhibition is the fact that as you saw, you know, as you were alluding to Renee, there were there were holy books that were that were altered in the making of your work. And you know, for you, Lisa, there were prayer books that were changed and you're creating, you're imagining texts that exist, you know, that, that aren't actually there. And I am fascinated by the question of what is more important? Is it the meaning of the book itself, or is it the object itself? And so, I guess, I don't know where my question to the three of you is, but maybe it's linked a little bit to um, to using materials and, the, and selecting materials specifically for their metaphorical importance. And so, if you want to, if I, <laughs> yeah. I think to kind of um, respond to your question, it was that the meaning of it overweighed what it meant to actually alter a Bible. And what I kept I kept asking myself was, is this is this okay? Like, how are people going to respond to this? Are they going to see that the message here is is really important? It's positive, um, but it did feel really strange to me to be altering and, and cutting up a Bible. And I I was very sort of ritualistic about it. I saved every scrap and piece from it, and I intend to use the pages that I haven't actually, you know, aren't in the book, but I'll use them in another piece, and I have them in a special box with, you know, also the little pieces of the cover. <laughs> so, um, so I was very conscious and very aware of what I was doing at the time, and um, my husband, who I found comes out often, you know, kept asking me, like, is this, is this okay? Like, Say a little bit more. 
more about this idea of the creation of a secondary meaning. Because, I mean, I think that what you're talking about is the fact that you, you've you taken a text that, that many of us think we know pretty well and that to some extent we think we own because it's a part of this broader tradition that, that affects so many aspects of American life. Mm -hmm. And yet what you're calling, what you're using the text to do is to call out this this part of history right. that we don't want to look at. And so there's this other, you know, there's this, there's this sort of a, the, it gets back to your idea of, recon, of deconstruction and reconstruction, that you're sort of, you're taking materials that you find and sort of and imbuing them with this important message that's almost like a transit, I don't know, sort of kind of rising up out of the materials mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. Not too scary yet, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I guess my thought would be that as the, the viewer would approach the piece, they would first, they would recognize that it, you know, it is a altered Bible, and by seeing sort of the black Bible and the white Bible together, that there would be there would be something, you know, a deeper meaning there, um, and also this idea that that sort of how I'm not sure what's the term for it, but religion was you, was being used right, in a way of yeah. have sort of terrorism in a way, you know, like despite the fact that they had to have separate Bibles for. So asking people to abide by the same sets of rules exactly. based on arbitrary differences. Exactly. Yeah. Lisa, can you talk a little bit about the metaphorical aspects of thread? I know that in the catalog essay that Maria Portia wrote for you, she talked about the wonderful, um, and it gets to this idea of finding the right materials to say the right, to, to, to use what, to use the mess, to, uh, to create the message <coughs> or some idea of the message. And I think that, um, Thread itself is such a metaphorically rich material, and I'd love to hear you talk about that. You've alluded to it as grounded in your parents' profession, and I'd love to hear you say a little more about that. Yeah, there's um, there's that. There's my background in textiles. I studied that um, as an undergraduate and as a graduate. Um, growing up around threads, around fabric, sewing, I got my first sewing machine you know, my grandmother worked in a tie factory in immigrant um, Romanian in New York. And so it's just, you know, it, it's almost um, as basic to me as, as reading or sewing in my life. And, and, you know, it was the livelihood of my parents, but also I made my own clothes. It was just all around. It was just kind of, kind of like inherited by osmosis. In the, in the body of work about my mother, of course, there's the umbilical reference. And the connection that I had to her, um, and you know, the connection of the text, and so I just felt like it was, you know, it's kind of a very, it's just a basic element. I mean, thread. Every one of us is wearing something from both thread. It's just so basic to human existence. So there's so many different levels that I felt like it worked on for this body of work, um, both my both my personal history and then kind of a more um, broader human history. I think the other thing that comes to mind is the idea of thread as a metaphor for narrative. And there's the lovely, you know, sort of the the passages that you asked your mother to write for you, the, the you know, the, the sequence of a prayer or the idea of of words and thoughts following following a thread or following a meaning. Right, yeah. Good point. Like <laughs> <laughs> Mel, um, I mentioned when I first started talking about how one of the things that excited me so much about your work is to see really contemporary technology specifically related to the use of video. I think so much um, contemporary video art that I see tends to be more sort of fascinated with what the technology can actually do than with what the technology actually enables an artist to say. And so if you want to talk a little, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about like why film and Well, my original fascination came because of song, and I thought moving image and sound are powerful ways to get across this idea of ambivalence, which is very difficult to do in, on a painting or a photograph, but I still tried. Um, there's something 
both sound, you have these overlapping, um, you can have two different notes that are both separate and intertwining, so you still have the distinctness of the note and the overlapping at the same time, so it literally is both things at the same time. Whereas with painting, you put blue on, you put red on, and you have purple, and you know, you don't, you don't have separateness anymore, so there's something very evocative about the moving image and sound that, that registers in a different way in your simultaneity of a kind of paradoxical shape, if you like. I want to ask a little, um, I want to ask a couple of questions about your practice as artists. I think one of the things that, one of the many things that struck me about putting this exhibition together is this idea of a very fine line between um, a devotional practice and a, sort of a repetition or um, kind of the process of actually bringing a work to life, whether it is meditative or whether it is grounded in discipline, for example. So kind of two questions along that. Um, the first, Lisa, you spoke a little bit about this, would be if you could address the idea of whether or not you see yourself as spiritual or individual or why or why not. And if in some ways the act of making art in your life is, if you see that as sort of a spiritual practice or as a meditative practice, if that, um, if that informs how you think about your work at all. I don't know which of you should go first. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, well, I think the word spiritual is used a lot. In fact, I think it's maybe used, overused. And so I have a hard time relating to it because of that. Um, I think that ritual is involved in, in being spiritual or religious. And so I think the connection for me is the ritual of showing up at my studio every day. Um, in the work about my mother, I felt like the ritual was very much present, you know, in that repetitive sewing those phrases and sewing her words. Um, it could be conceived of perhaps as kind of a secular prayer. And the closest I get to a prayer. Um, was there, was there a, I guess I'm wondering about sort of an experience of transcendence, which is also something I think of with prayer. And did you, did you find, did you find yourself in any kind of a going to a spiritual or maybe a, a philosophical or, I don't know, maybe this is too much to ask, but I guess I just, I imagine um, epiphanies and transformations that can come from making work. And I wonder if you experienced any of that when you're working on a work by your mother. I, I experienced I experienced this visceral need to do it, and um, the showing up and doing it, and over and over and over again, much the way people um, you know chant or recite prayers do. So um, it just all I can say is that I felt that I had to do it. It was the way that I was processing the fact that my mom was no longer with us. Um, so to the extent that that has a relationship to this prayer, that's. That was my form of it. Yeah, or maybe devotion is the word I'm looking for. Too. Right, and then, then there's all the devotion to, to being an artist, to, to showing up at one's studio, despite the fact that no one has any questions about what one is doing, <laughs> you know, whether it's going to make sense to anyone else, whether it makes even makes sense to oneself, you know, <laughs> all of these questions. In a way, being an artist is, you know, kind of a, a, a ritual or a, or a devotional occupation mm -hmm. in a way. Showing up without necessarily knowing what's going to happen and just having some kind of inner faith or belief that something will come of what you're doing. And at the end of the day, sometimes feeling really not so good at what did come out and then showing up the next day hoping that it'll be better. So there's an interesting um, TED talk that Elizabeth Gilbert gave. I don't know if anyone's seen it or heard it. It's a, she talks about the cross eyed genius that, you know, do we think of it as this divine inspiration? Um, or mm -hmm. And so she talked uh, about how um, we kind of need to let go of that sense of it being internalized. We just need to show up and then literally tell that, you know, speak to the corner and just say, if you're willing to come and do your part, that's great, but I'm going to do my part and I'm going to show up and work like a dog. And that's my job. And so I really love the way she talked about it. I would highly recommend it. Yeah. Well, and it gets a little bit to this idea of art as a discipline in the same sense that research and writing is a discipline, in the same sense that writing poetry is a discipline, in the same sense that science is a discipline as well. You know, that there is this, I think one of the, we'll talk in a second about myths surrounding the artistic process, which will build a little bit on, you know, the 
Hawkeye's genius in the corner of the room. But I think it's um, because there are these sort of stereotypical notions that that art con that art arrives in a blinding flash of inspiration. That it's not often understood that there is that there is research and that there is development and that there are mistakes and that there's there's ugly stuff that comes out and on the way to the things that we just didn't know. So maybe go back to <laughs> I've taken us off off track. Renee, I don't know if you wanted to say anything about the idea of devotion and um, artwork as a or make a, a process. Similar to um, what Lisa said, that you know, there will be an idea or a thought, and it will just pester me until I engage, physically engage in making um, the, the piece of art. Um, I I wouldn't say that it's a spiritual practice, but it definitely has some um, spiritual components to it because I find. I like the way you describe you describe the sort of the state of mind of making you prone to listen. I think that's a it's a nice you know when we do, when we struggle with words like spirituality and prayer and devotion because they don't I think that it, it's hard for them to do all of the sort of metaphorical heavy lifting that we want them to do. I think they're words that are so overused and so pregnant with possibility that to to find yet another <coughs> metaphor for thinking. Mel, do you want to talk about devotion and making art? <laughs> <laughs> well, you asked if we were earlier if we were a spiritual person. I, I guess I would have to say yes, but I say it with some trepidation because I never know quite what people mean by spiritual. And um, but to the extent that my practice is spiritual, I would say that in that it, it's a form of truth seeking, and that I'm I think of art making in many ways as a grappling with uh, it's like another thinking tool. It's another way of knowing something or not knowing something. And so I feel like with the work, I actually question and deepen my question and my own faith evolves through the work. And, and I hope and invite that others do the same, you know, if that's possible. That's my a goal, that's sort of the lofty goal, I guess. Um, but I don't really like to define it on such terms to say that it's necessarily spiritual. But I feel like that can really change <coughs> the meaning of the work and it shuts it down for a lot of people. Um, I'm particularly aware of that because I was in grad school. Um, my UC, that UC Berkeley professor specifically said, whatever you do, do not make work that's spiritual. And, uh, and I thought, well, that's interesting because I always thought art was all about breaking the rules and didn't know there was anything off limits. But I think what I understood from that to mean is like, understandably, it's a complex, loaded, historically loaded subject matter. There's a potential for it to be overly sentimental. There's a potential for it to be self-righteous. There's a potential for religious egoism and for formulaic truths to come into play. And so I really try and find a way in all that to negotiate this fine line of disrupting that conversation in some way that feels helpful to me, but hopefully and hopefully to others. You just helped me figure out some things that 
that I've been trying to say, I think, for about the last hour and 15 minutes. So thank you. And I think that's one of the nice things about um, collaborative, this idea of collaborative meaning making and what happens when you bring people together. So I'd like to turn it over to question and answer from all of you if there are things that those of you who have been sitting here so attentively and patiently for the last little bit would like to ask of our artists today. We would love to, we would love to hear from you. <laughs> Sheila? I don't think all of you have um, talked through this in, in some way, but what I'm always struck by with artists is their ability to take an idea or an emotion or something that's just rattling around in your brain that's not connecting and to make something, I mean, I'm using the word positive, but third dimensional, two dimensional, so that people can actually see that thing in their heads. And while you're Is that, you know, I, we're using words like prayer and things, but is that sort of like in and of itself a healing process as you're going through grief or, or helping you explore more the idea, just the practical part of making it real? <laughs> One thing I've noticed is I have difficulty staying in prayer sometimes. <laughs> But when I'm in my studio, I'm really in the presence. I'm, I'm showing, I'm, I'm in the zone. You know, somebody could walk into the studio, and just, you know, because I'm just so, I'm just like watching that thread, you know, in its own issue. So, you know, I think it, it's, in this, you know, era that we live in with all the devices that everybody has, and email and all that other Facebook and everything, you know, everybody's walking down the street checking their everything and connected to everything and I'm you know I'm I'm not I'm not that much on Facebook or any of that stuff but I'm I'm always thinking of the future I'm always kind of planning and stuff but when I'm in my studio I'm right there and so that is a really helpful and in and of itself you know positive thing for me you know I, I hesitate, hesitate to use the word therapeutic another kind of word that sometimes is used in connection to art that has the personal content but What's to say it's just a really positive thing for me? Um, it really uh, improves the quality of my life. I wish I had that same feeling. That's what I always imagine, like they're drawing or painting, that you have this, that it would be very ritualistic and it would just be this sense of the condensed jar and you could kind of do all these things. <laughs> I imagine a studio practice to be. Whereas it seems that every time I start a new project, it's like this metaphorical ground zero. I might be, you might find it out. I'm like being taken out. So it's like this metaphorical ground zero every time, and it's just like you're in free fall. You're wondering each time it's a totally different project. There are new, there's new technologies to learn. The last piece I did, I had to learn three channel um, thinking, bright sign technology, five channel surround sound, and um, all using new psychoacoustic technology that was being developed by. Oh, acoustic scientists. So it was just, you know, really just learning from the ground up each and every time. And so it, it, it really feels scary, I would say, for the most part. <laughs> and But hopefully in the long run, there are those flashes and those moments where you kind of feel like it was all worth it. Well, thank you for talking a little bit about that because I think that there's, in some ways, the technology that you're using is both so familiar to people now and yet so removed from the idea of how we think of art being made. And so I want to talk a little bit about, for you to talk about what, what, your, what the steps of your practice are a little bit, specifically with regard to the kinds of things that you're using. But I don't want to give Renee short shrift if she wants to answer Sheila's question. So mm -hmm. hold that thought. So as far as um, healing goes, I would say probably not, but a lot of growth happens for me in making a piece. Um, nine times out of ten, it's never easy <laughs> for me. Um, you know, the, the idea will come to me and I'll have to work something and rework it until it gets to the point that I want it to be. And so. More of a growth than it is a growth period for me than healing, and not 
also say that um, you know that that's been I've had I've had a lot of adapt in my life the last probably ten years and so I would say that there's um, there's some solitary and like being in my studio and working um, although my studio is an art building so I always have students popping in and out which is lovely but um, I would say that there's you know there's probably some some um, something that comes from being like being by myself in, in that process. Can we yeah, talk about yeah, that? Yeah. <laughs> go go from there. Yeah, it's following you. It's kind of being left behind. I'm not going to be further away. Um, so that my process I would say is never the same, but I think like there's probably some kind of rhyme or reason to it, but um, I work a lot in teams, and I work both collaboratively um, as well and individually. So a lot of it is on the phone and communicating and managing a project like that. And sometimes it starts off in the most innocuous way. And like the most recent project was because I, w I visited a senior at the local nursing home with my two boys. And when she passed away, I was also asked at the same time to do a commission and ended up doing it in her honor and just ended up meaning that we had Formative participatory um, uh, singing celebration in her honor at the senior center, which you know, so it meant that became something else, which became something else. So it has a very, I have to really just pay attention, like you were saying, you, you know, you, that's part of the practice is paying attention to what is hitting me. Once in a while, I get a real gift. So I would love this is when you visited me. Uh, when you visited me at the Headlands, I had just stumbled upon. I went to the beach early one morning, ready to uh, film something in the sand. It was about six or o'clock in the morning. And there on the beach was this huge sailboat just lying there. I'm talking like a 40-foot keel boat. And it was just lying there really beautifully, perfect shadow on the sand, just looking blue sky, no one around except for a surfer. We were both looking at each other going, is it your boat? No, is it your, no. So I ended up filming this boat. I had gone there, ironically enough, to film the word save me that I was gonna write in the sand. And then I uncovered a tragedy, the tragedy that happened and that became the piece that I worked on um, that I paired with my sister whistling a hymn. And then that became a two-channel piece that I worked on five years later with another artist named Dean Finley and Pamela Z. So it just takes on life of its own and that's why it's a little scary because I can't follow a recipe. <laughs> okay, I think we have time for one more question. Are there others from the audience? Well, I kind of let the cat out of the bag because when we talked earlier, I said there was nothing in it. But since we've talked, I don't say that anymore. <laughs> because I had originally conceived of them as being like research proposals for a book that I wanted to develop that would mobilize spiritual and moral inquiry. But I didn't know how to do that, so I started by designing the book. But then I grew, I really loved the idea of the object of the book and the idea that it was this mystery and became, I. Um, really influenced by um, the possibility of the book being about hope and possibility and transformation seemed an important idea in, in kind of a similar way to another little, I'm doing a project on TED Talks, so I watched a lot of TED Talks recently, to this guy called J.J. Abrams. He's a, a producer and writer of Lost, and he talked about the mystery box, and the mystery box was this magic box that he bought uh, decades earlier that he sat on his office shelf and, and it kind of, he's the producer of Lost, that might help you um, key into what he's talking about here. And he doesn't, he's never opened it. And so, but to him, he'll never open it because that box represents the hope, possibility, transformation, and is more important to him almost than the knowledge of what's in there. And so since I've talked to you, I've really come to see the books as, I, I really don't even speak to them as, as not having anything in them. I like to think of them as actually being Something there that I that it, that you're imagining as a viewer and I'm imagining together, and that's more powerful than anything I could do on my own, mm -hmm. in some ways. 
I think that's a pretty good place to stop. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for being here. The artists will be around for a little while afterwards, and if you have questions that you'd like to ask of us individually, um, please do so. Thank you for being so attentive, and I think. Just one final step. I, Teresa Leslie Wellesley, who is the director of the institute and who wanted to thank you personally, was called out briefly to pick up her children. Uh, She'll be back, but on her behalf, uh, and on behalf of the Ignatian Center and Seneca University, I want to thank you very much for your presence as well as for your contributions and collaborations to the public So thank you so much.